Should people change for their partners? The answer is always no, but you need to really pay attention to the question. Should people ever change for their partner? No, who you should be changing for is for yourself. Your partner should be the type of person though that makes you want to change yourself. You should only be in a relationship with somebody who's inspiring to your life, who being around them just makes you wanna be better, who makes you feel like you need to earn them in that relationship. So by their influence alone, they should be modeling a high standard for their lives that makes you inspired to wanna have a higher standard for yourself, but it's still for yourself. You should never wanna change who you are for that other person. The only time you should ever be changing and having that reason involve your partner is because the way that your partner is living, it's not that they're shoving something down your throat saying you need to live this way or develop this habit or do this or whatever, but they should be an inspiration to you that make you want to be better so you are being better. But that doesn't mean that you're changing for your partner. That means you're changing for you because of your partner. What's up, guys? Welcome back to episode, I think, 48 of the Conscious Cast, and I think 14 of the Jason Sklora Show. Today, we're doing, I'm doing, a collaborative episode. Anyways, yeah, it's a collaborative episode. You know, I thought that Relationships 1 went well, so did Cal, uh, for the Conscious Cast, and I want to start doing them for my YouTube, and I could obviously just continue to do it for the Conscious Cast, so why not do two birds, one stone? This might be a weekly thing. We'll see how it goes. We'll see if you like it. We'll see if we like it. And we'll take it from there. Today, we're talking about something brand new and crazy. No, we're not. We're talking about relationships. <laughs> Woo! Relationships. But probably some in the thumbnail may, uh, probably suggested that. But we got more questions, baby. I, I like these a lot. I really, really, really like riffing about just whatever people are wondering, right? And I have a ton of questions from people. I sent a couple texts out. People, people delivered to say the least. And if you're one of those people, thank you. I love you. You guys are weird. <clears throat> okay. First set of questions. Oh, that was gross. My apologies. I haven't even read these yet, so this is off the riff for sure. First question. How do you navigate a relationship with someone who can't communicate? Hmm. How do you navigate a relationship with somebody who can't communicate? Um, <laughs> my first suggestion would be navigate yourself in a different direction away from that specific human being. Because if you try to get into a relationship with somebody who doesn't know how to communicate, that relationship is not going to be a relationship. I don't know what the fuck to call a relationship without communication, but it's not a fucking relationship, right? Like if, if you're with somebody who doesn't know how to correctly address issues with someone who doesn't know to, how to set boundaries for themselves and, and, and voice their opinions on things or whatever, they can't communicate. There's no way you're going to even know who the fuck this person is, right? Because if they're not willing to admit their flaws, if they're not willing to get past issues, if they're not willing to communicate about their wants and their needs and helping you with your wants and your needs... What do you think? What is that? What is that? How do I navigate that? You, you you don't. You don't navigate that. You navigate yourself away from people who don't know how to communicate because you're never going to have a good relationship with somebody who can't communicate. If you or anybody else is in a relationship and you don't know how to communicate, I defy you to show me one of those relationships that are actually healthy. I defy you. You're not going to find one. You're not. It's impossible. So yeah, I'm a little fired up right now. Question two is cheating justifiable um okay let me look up the term justifiable just so that i don't use this word in the wrong context i get what the word means but i just want to make sure just if justifiable definition justifiable able to be shown to be right or reasonable no cheating is never ever 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 justifiable right the reason why I looked it up because I wanted to be, I wanted to make sure there I want people to understand there are many many reasons to cheat. There are probably many good reasons to cheat. As you know, dark as that seems, there are good reasons. If you're in a shitty relationship with somebody, but you 
are so tied up. Maybe you have kids or whatever, but your relationship is going terrible. And for the sake of the kids, you can't just, you don't want to get in divorce. And, and so you handle it in the best way you, you kind of could. And, and you're cheating, right? I'm not advocating for cheating. I, I just, the first, my first answer is no, it's not justifiable, right? In that situation, you should have the moral and ethical structure to you, who you are as a person to figure out a different way to meet your needs than to go and cheat on somebody, right? Um, or understand that maybe it's probably best for you to get divorced, even though it might not be easy for the kids or whatever. Like, it, what might be harder for your kids is is staying is, is them growing up with two parents that don't know how to model a proper relationship, and so they're going to be all fucked up when they get older, especially because you aren't the good person you want to be when you're around your husband or around your wife. So they're they're being raised by parents who are always in terrible moods and, and acting in ways that they would regret, right? So who knows? Anyways, no, it's never justifiable, right? Especially, I see this all the time with, with the younger, with younger crowds. It, for me, it doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any fucking sense because if you are in a relationship with somebody and you feel the need to cheat, think about why. But why do you want to cheat? Right? The, don't try and hide the fact that you do want to cheat. It's fine. Like, it, don't judge yourself for wanting to. Look at why. Do you actually like, lo, like slash love the person you're with? Do you actually want to be with them? Do your personalities match? Do your values match? Are they not giving you enough attention? Are you not being a good enough boyfriend or girlfriend so that you would deserve that kind of attention and deserve that kind of person that's going to treat you amazing? So then you're not going to want, the, there's not going to be a byproduct of, I feel like cheating because I'm not having my needs met by my partner. Like there's so many things that can go into it, right? But it's never justifiable. It's never because if you really feel that need to cheat and you want to do it so bad, right? Like you're at the club and you're dancing with a girl, whatever. And you just be like, fuck dude, like it's going to happen. I'm going to hook up with this person tonight. As shitty as it sounds, at least break up with the person beforehand. Like as e like even if the best that you're going to do that night is literally give them a call and say, hey, sorry, we're done. We could talk about this tomorrow and completely ruin their night. At least you broke up with them and didn't cheat on them, right? Because the level of damage that you can, you can and probably are doing to someone when they trust you and then you betray their trust by doing something as severe as cheating, you you're fucking them up way more than you would have if you had at least had had the decency to call them and be like, hey, like, I just, I know this is terrible and I know this is super shitty, but we're, we're over. We're not in a relationship anymore. I, I'm out right now and I can't talk, but we can talk about tomorrow. That's terrible too, right? I get that. But if you're, if you're that, if it's that ingrained in your body of like, I need to cheat right now, or I need to hook up with this person tonight. I'm not going home without getting my dick wet with this bitch tonight. Then... At least give them something. Give them something. The answer is no. It's never justifiable to cheat. Should people change for their partners? No. The answer to that is always no. Um, but I think changing as a result of your partner being there is essential to healthy relationships to healthy relationships, right? So I'm gonna say that again. I want I want this to be clear and I'm gonna explain. But should people change for their partners? The answer is always no, but you need to really pay attention to the question. Should people ever change for their partners? No. Who you should be changing for is for yourself, right? Your partner should be the type of person, though, that makes you want to change yourself. You should only be in a relationship with somebody who is inspiring to your life who being around them just makes you want to be better, who makes you feel like you need to earn them in that relationship, right? So by their influence alone, they should be modeling a high standard for their lives that makes you inspired to want to have a higher standard for yourself, but it's still for yourself. You should never want to change who you are for that other person, right? Whether it's you don't connect well, so you want to change who you are so that you can match well because you've made some imaginary fairy tale in your mind of you walking down the aisle with this person, even though you know deep down you don't connect with them. No, you shouldn't change for them in that aspect ever. That's fairly obvious. I would think that that's something I don't even need to say, but yes. But like I said, the only time you should ever be changing and having that reason involve your partner is because the way that your partner is living, it's not that they're shoving something down your throat saying you need to live this way or develop this habit or do this or whatever, but 
they should be an inspiration to you that make you want to be better so you are being better right? Like if you get into a relationship with somebody and they're working out like mad and they're taking care of their body and they're just living a life where they're in, in they're such control of their body and they look amazing and they feel amazing. And as a result of that, you're going to start working out and you're going to start eating healthier. That's awesome. That's awesome. But that doesn't mean that you're changing for your partner. That's mean That means you're changing for you because of your partner, which is awesome. Obviously, that's fucking awesome. And I think everybody should be in relationships with people that inspire them and make them want to be better. Because if you're not, I don't know. Why would you feel the need? Like like if you're in a relationship with somebody and they don't hold themselves to a high standard, aka they don't respect themselves, what's going to make you feel like you need to, A, need to put in any work to earn their respect when they don't even respect themselves, or B, that... Or B, what makes you think that you actually respect yourself if you're willing to settle for somebody else who doesn't respect themselves? Do you know what I'm saying? Um, maybe that makes sense. Next question. How do you know if you have healed from a breakup? How do you know if, you he if you've healed from a breakup? Um, that's a good question. To me, it's not it's not always a black and white answer, right? Because you got to understand what healed means, right? Where maybe a lot of times people don't define words the same, right? And what healed means to me is may not be what feeling like you've been you're healed from that relation, your your ex girlfriend or boyfriend or whatever. That the def our definitions might not be the same, right? So that's that's why that question is a little difficult. But to answer the question, how do I know if I've healed from a relationship? For me, again, this is completely subjective. For me, that means that when you think of that person, when you think of that relationship, the emotional valence, right? The, the strength of the emotion that you feel, right? That shitty ch feeling in your chest of like, fuck, like I miss them. That's the, like, uh, like a part of your soul has been ripped out, right? You know that feeling when you have a breakup and then you think about the person the next week or the next day and it's just like, oh, that pit in your stomach. When the emotional valence of that is low enough to the point where you can talk to a new guy or a new girl and not have that feeling being, not have that feeling come up all the time when you're with them. You could focus on being present with that other person that you're maybe talking to or, or, or dating or whatever. Um, that's when, it, that's when I feel like you've known, you can actually say that you're, you're healed enough because a lot of times when shit happens and shit hits a fan like you're never gonna actually fully heal from whatever it was that happened you know people people go through a lot of fucking shit you know and and life is fucking hard but even though it's hard and and we all have our fair share of shit that gets thrown our way and a lot of people worse than others doesn't mean that you shouldn't it doesn't mean that you should hold yourself back from the beauty of life that comes when you're open and vulnerable and allow yourself to love other people and be loved from other people. Uh, don't cheat yourself from that just because, you know, someone else has hurt you. Um, and Jordan Peterson talks about this a lot. He says, you know that you've fully digested uh, a life crisis, a life crisis, a life crisis. You know, you fully digested a life crisis when I, I'm paraphrasing this a lot, like I don't know if this is exactly what he said, but he says, you know that you fully digested something, especially like a, a crazy shitty life experience that happened to you or somebody passes away or whatever. When 18 months after that event occurred, you no longer have that super strong emotional reaction anymore. Right. I, I'm paraphrasing that again, but I, I think that that's actually a good rule of thumb is like, if 18 months after your relationship, a year and a half after your relationship ends, you still aren't over it, you feel like you still haven't healed after a year and a half, that, and I think that's a very good time for you to take a good look at yourself and to take a good look at what had happened and to take a good look at where you think you went wrong and see what you can do about that. Or, I mean, going to therapy is a, 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 an amazing idea as well when, when things like that happen. Um, can you really get over your first love yeah the fuck <coughs> with that said 
I do not think it's impossible. I don't. I, I do not think it's possible, in my opinion, for you to fall out of love with somebody, right? Because when you fall in love with somebody, you fall in love with that version of that person, even if they get dark and twisted and fucked up and start abusing you and start being a terrible person in a relationship and you break up because they, you know, they they changed and they they changed for the worst or whatever. You're still gonna forever be in love with that version of them. Although it doesn't exist anymore, in the same sense where you can't not fall out of love with somebody if they die, right? You can't just not lo- be in love with that version of them. It just means that they that version of them doesn't exist anymore, right? So that, that I just want to get that clear. Because you can get over your first love. Um, because no matter what happens... If you're not in a relationship with them, for whatever reason, whether it's 100% your fault, 50-50, 100% their fault, doesn't matter. If you're not with them and you're not in a relationship, by definition, they're not the one. They're not. Because if they were the one and you were supposed to be with them right now, you would be with them right now. They're not with you, which means they can't be the one. Because the one is with you. As shitty as that sounds, it's the fucking truth. And the fact that you may be wishing that, you know, they were back in your life, they were back in your life and that, you know, you still had a relationship with them and that things were working out how you would hope for them to work out, that's all in your imagination. That's all that is. And not for nothing, if you're not in a relationship with them and things were... Jesus Christ. I'm getting parched. and you're not in a relationship with them, there has to be something that went wrong. If you both truly felt you should be together and there were no problems with that, you would be together. That never, ever happens. There's never a relationship between two people that want to be together and despite their issues are willing to commit to each other and then don't. That doesn't happen. I don't care what they tell you, they're either lying or you don't understand what the fuck is going on. But by definition, if you were supposed to be with someone, you'd be with them. And even if they broke your heart, and even if shit hit the fan, and even if you're feeling shitty as fuck because of that relationship being over, you can get over your first love, or your second love, or your third or fourth or fifth or whatever. You can get over any relationship. You can, but it's up to you. And if you're not, then you really have to take a look at where you're going to get your closure. And I need to make this clear because I've said this a million times, but I'll keep saying it. The only way you're going to be able to move on from any relationship, any relationship, is when you get closure within yourself, right? And the example I always give, give is, imagine if your partner dies. They die. Does that mean you can never have closure because you don't know why they maybe cheated on you or why shit hit the fan or whatever? Does that mean you can never, ever, ever have closure? No, because closure comes from you and yourself alone. It makes it easier when they give you explanations, but it doesn't make it impossible when they don't. It's up to you because the closure that, that because the feeling of closure is only accompanied by when you take responsibility and fix where you went wrong. Whatever it is, I don't care what the situation is. I don't care what the situation is. That's where closure comes from. Next question. How do I overcome insecurity on both sides of the partnership? How do you overcome insecurity? The root of the answer of overcoming insecurities is building habits and lowering expectations. Those are the two aspects of overcoming insecurity right? Because insecurity is just another way of saying you're not confident. You don't have self-love, right? Because people who true have true self-love don't aren't insecure, right? That's just when you love yourself, you're not insecure because you don't judge yourself. You don't. And the way to love yourself is A, treat yourself like you love yourself, take care of yourself, live a life that you're not going to regret living or, or live a life where you wouldn't want to trade with anybody else because of how good you're treating yourself and how, and of how good you're living your life. But two, make sure your expectations aren't set at unattainable standards. Your standards should be high. Don't get me wrong. They should be very high, but don't set them at a bar where it's unattainable because then you'll always be insecure because you'll always be insufficient. 
right? You should be working your ass off to the best that you can, but the bar shouldn't be set at a place where even when you are working your ass off and giving your 100% that you're not meeting that bar, right? So those are the two aspects of, of insecurity. And when you do things in a manner where you act like you love yourself and you're living out those habits and you have the bar set at a place that's reasonably high, that and you'll know if you morally set it high enough for yourself, self-love and a loss of the feeling of insecurity will come as a byproduct of that. As a byproduct of loving yourself and living in that manner, the insecurity goes away. And when you're no longer insecure and your partner's no longer insecure, that's when your relationship will flourish for many reasons, right? Think about it. For, if you love yourself unconditionally and you treat yourself like you love yourself and you're not insecure, those kinds of people are much more willing to admit when they're wrong. They're much more willing to have conversations saying, yeah, I fucked up. I apologize, right? And with that, anything that could be a problem or does turn into a problem won't be a problem for very long. It won't because you both take full responsibility for your shit. So when shit hits the fan, you're like, I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry. Here's how I contributed. Here's how I contributed. This is what we're going to do about it. We're good. I love you. I love myself. I love you. I love myself. That's when the relationship gets phenomenally, phenomenally healthy. It's it's wild. It's I've experienced both sides of it. It's a whole different fucking world. I actually spilled this all over the gym floor this morning. It was terrible. Dude, a guy was walking out of the locker room, and I was filling up my water, and then I turned, and he was so close to me, and it scared the shit out of me because, like, I turned, he was just there, and I had my headphones in, whatever, and I dropped my water, and I just filled it to the top, and it smacked the ground and splashed all up this man's body. It was, he just looked at me, and I was like, I am so fucking sorry, and he was, Thank God he was so nice about it. He's like, no, it's fine, it's fine, it's fine. He was sweaty as fuck from the sauna, I think, anyway. So he was like, whatever, it's a little more water. But, yeah, I cleaned it up, too. So I didn't feel like a douchebag having to, like, walk around, like, looking at the edge, people cleaning up the the, the, the floor. And I'm just sitting there like, who did that? Like, what idiot drops their water? Got some other good questions. I like this one. How do you attract the relationships, or relationship that you want, or relationships, right? Friend, friendships or intimate relationships doesn't really matter. It's the same. It's the same sort of. <clears throat> it's the same equation, and it's very simple to understand. The way to attract any person into your life is to be that person. Think about that. The way to attract whoever you want to your life is to become what you want to see. Become that individual. Don't try and be somebody you're not, but be more of who you are. If you want somebody in a relationship that takes care of their physical health, you're never going to attract them if you're not somebody that takes care of your health. If you're not somebody that works out, you can't expect to attract anybody into your life that exercises themselves right because in the same sort in the same sense where you don't want to settle for somebody that doesn't exercise they though that exact person is not going to be the type of person that wants to settle for somebody that doesn't exercise either right or takes care of their mental health or their spirituality or cleans their room or anything right whether it's a friendship or relationship doesn't matter if you want to attract that person into your life you need to embody those traits <clears throat> If you want a relationship with somebody that takes responsibility for when they fuck up, you damn well better be the type of person that takes responsibility for when you fuck up. It just, it, it's not going to work any other way. Because in the same sense where you wouldn't settle for somebody less than that, they are not going to settle for somebody less than that either. And it's crazy of you to think that, that, that to expect them to, to expect somebody else to settle for something that you're not willing to settle for. That's ridiculous. Completely ridiculous. Next question. Should you be looking for a relationship or should you just let it come to you? Hmm. I like that question. Should you be looking for a relationship or should you just let it come to you? I think the answer is both. Let me explain why. First of all, I find it's very hard to give advice to people on 
chasing and like going out there and trying to get a girlfriend or a boyfriend just because when you're doing that it's just I don't know. It's like it's just fucking desperate behavior, right? And the only people that you're going to attract as a result of your desperate behavior are not high quality individuals. They're not high valued people. You're not going to attract, you know, people who actually love themselves into your life when you're acting all desperate and are just really trying to get into a relationship with somebody. With that said, the flip side of the coin is is and this is going to sound very contradictory to what I just said, but you got to put yourself out there, right? It's not, it doesn't necessarily mean you have to go and shake up, shake every girl's hand at the bar and say, let's go on a date, let's go on a date, let's go on a date. I want to figure out who I want to have as my girlfriend. That's not what I'm saying. But what I am saying is get yourself into uncomfortable situations, make new friends, meet new people, right? I think that's, that's probably actually the underlying theme here is meet new people, you don't have to want to fuck them to go and hang out with new people, right? But when you make more friends and you make more connections and you meet new people, eventually you're going to run into a good amount of people that you're like, damn, I fucking like this person or she's hot or he's fucking awesome or I would, I want to go on a date with this person or whatever, right? But unless you put yourself out there into uncomfortable situations, especially if you're somebody who's more introverted, then you're always going to be stuck in this spot where you're like, fuck, I wish I had a girl. Fuck, I wish I had a girl. Fuck, I wish I had a girl. It's like, dude, you don't even go out and meet new people. You don't even go out and experience things. You're not joining any clubs. You're not reaching out to anybody. When you're with mutual friends, you don't introduce yourself. Like, how do you expect to, you know what I'm saying? You got to attract some of that into your life by putting yourself in uncomfortable situations where you're willing to stick your neck out. And even if you're going to get rejected, at least make an effort. So there's a balance there. Um, I don't think you should pursue everyone all desperately because you're not going to attract anybody good that way. But I also don't think you should kick back and say, well, the good, the, the girl that's meant for me is going to, you know, just fall into my lap. So, and some random perfect occasion, like you think it works in the movies. It just doesn't work that way. At least in my opinion. Yeah, I mean, try it out. But my, my guess would be that's not going to turn out too hot for you. How to not be blind to red flags. Good question. On the last episode, I answered pretty much this exact question. And I gave the example that Tony Robbins gave. And he said he was on a bus and he had a map out. And he wanted to figure out who, literally it was a map. He was on the bus with a physical map. And he was talking about how he wants to figure out how to attract the perfect woman into his life, right? I think he had recently gone through a divorce. And he's sitting there and he's like, fuck it. I'm going to write down every single thing I could ever want in a girl ever. And he writes on his map. And he writes down every single trait he could want. He said he wrote for like hours. And he just wrote every little thing as like as specific and as broad as he could possibly think of. He let his brain fully exhaust every single possible thing he could ever want in this woman, right? A woman that doesn't even exist, right? With all these traits, like from exactly how she looks physically to exactly what her personality is like to exact literally everything, right? And then he goes back through and he said he checked off and starred every single one of those things that were absolute make or breaks, right? And so for him, I mean, so for me, things of like I literally have it in my notebook right now, one of them is honesty, right? As cliche as that sounds, I don't care if you have every single other thing on that list, whether it's literally specific as a five foot two blonde girl with double D boobs or what, like literally that specific, like it, it doesn't matter. But you go back through, check off the things that are absolute make or breaks for you and then have that be your list, right? Because that's the list that actually matters. Once you have that list, so do this exercise. If you want to, if you're the type of person that can't, that find yourself, finds yourself ignoring many red flags, do this exercise. Okay. I'm rambling a lot. I want this to be clear. I'm trying, I'm trying to be concise here because there's a lot of things to explain and sometimes I'm bad at explaining. So I'm sorry. <clears throat> if you're the type of person that constantly ignores red flags, try this exercise. What I want you to do is take out a pen and paper and write down every single thing you could want in a partner. Everything from as broad to as specific as you can get. Whether it's I want them to be honest and trustworthy to as I want them to be 5'2 and blonde and have massive boobs or what, literally whatever. And then after you've made that list and you should have literally hundreds of things, go back through and check off the things that are absolute make or breaks. Absolute make or breaks, meaning they can have all 299 other things on the list. If they don't have this one thing, it's over. You can't be with them. An example of that is like honesty or kindness, right? Those are cliche, but those are two things that are absolute make or breaks. So for some people, it's maybe we have to have a matching sense of humor, whatever. When you get into the honeymoon phase with somebody, 
Look at that list. Don't ignore it, right? You can't. You can't ignore it. And when you have a pen and paper, it's impossible to ignore it because you're going to be like, oh, they have this, they have this, they have this, they have this. And you're going to be like, oh, fuck. They're a liar. I've noticed they've lied about some things. Oh, fuck. We don't match on our senses, sense of humor. Oh, she doesn't believe in God. That's an absolute make or break for me. Whatever it is for you. When you go back through and look at that list, you're going to be like, fuck. I can't get into a relationship with this person. I can't. Because I, at this point in time, it's too objective. You can't ignore the red flags. So when you have them written down, trust me, it will completely change the game. It's going to be annoying in the moment because, you know, when you're in a honeymoon phase with somebody, everything seems perfect on the surface. But then when you go back through, go back to your list, you're going to find, a, you might find a bunch of things that you're like, fuck, they miss these things. And instead of getting into that relationship and then six months, a year, year and a half down the road, you falling into some stupid bullshit problems because you ignored the red flags that you could have decided to not ignore, right? So pick your evil here. Either A, you pick the evil of having to deal with the fact that you're not going to be able to get into the relationship that you wanted to get into or deal with the fact that you're going to have a shitty relationship that's going to end anyways or stay in a shitty relationship. Pick your fucking poison. There's no path with daisies and roses. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. But this list will save you a lot of time. And instead of getting into a shitty relationship, you can move on and actually find the person that you will work to be with. Up to you. To each their own. Can you overlook anything from your partner's past? Yes. And I mean everything. Everything. That's how the philosophy works. Because the philosophy is, I don't care how bad you've been at one point in your life. My judgment and my opinion of you is based on what you're giving me now. Is the past a good indicator of the future? Yes. Is it really, really important to not ignore red flags? Yes. If so, Let's say, for example, somebody had cheated on their past in their past relationship. Does that mean now you, you shouldn't get into a relationship with this person even if they've changed, right? Let's say, for example, they cheat on their partner and they realize the reason why they cheated was because they were insecure and their insecurity led them to getting into a shitty relationship with somebody they didn't care about, which led them, combined with their insecurity and immaturity, to cheat on them. A couple years have passed. They broke up. They learned from their mistakes. They're now a confident individual who's matured and is ready for a relationship why would you not get into a relationship with them if you know that you're going to if you know that it could work out and and would work out you shouldn't base your decisions on how somebody used to be or what they have done or whatever you really shouldn't it's up to you but i think it it would be helpful for all of us to allow people to learn from their mistakes and let their mistakes just be mistakes not have them be paying for their sins in a sense for the rest of their lives because the payment up for their sins should be I'm going to fix my mistake so that I can treat somebody the right way so I can be the best girlfriend or boyfriend that I could possibly be so that I don't make these stupid errors over and over again right and if they have taken that responsibility and they have made the changes necessary and you believe that they have then their past has nothing to do with it anymore it has nothing to do with it anymore. And at that point in time, the problem is likely you and your trust issues. And we all have had our fair share of bullshit that has happened that, have, that has completely betrayed our trust. A lot of people worse than others, and I get it. But we've all been there. But for you to not let somebody open up to you, and for you to not open up to somebody because you were hurt in the past by someone else, that's a you problem, not a them problem, right? It doesn't mean it was your fault. It doesn't mean it was your fault that somebody did you dirty. It doesn't mean it's your fault that you're in the shitty position that you're in or feel the way you feel. But it's damn well your fucking responsibility to do something about it. Because if you keep carrying your trust issues into the relationship after relationship after relationship, you're not going to heal what you need to heal. Because you're so focused on them, them, them. It's everybody else's fault, even though it actually is everybody else's fault. Instead of, what can I do to make it better? Do I need to work on my self-confidence? Do I need to work on my level of self-love? Do I need to work on my ability to notice red flags so I don't get into shitty relationships? 
Where are you going wrong? Because if the truth of the matter is, is if you can't get into a relationship with anybody that you can trust, that's probably a you problem. It probably is. And if it's not 100% your problem or your fault, it's at least a decent amount your fault at this point in time. And it's tough. I hate to say it. It's not what I wanted to say, but it's what you need to hear. <sighs> Next question. Talk about the quote unquote, if they wanted to, they would saying talk about the the saying if they wanted to they would if they wanted to they would i hear that a lot and a lot of times it's highly applicable and highly true but a lot of times it's not it's not a cookie cutter answer with these kinds of things there's a lot of factors that play into the that play into certain situations that would make somebody say if they wanted to, they would, right? For example, if, you know, you're trying to make plans with somebody consistently and, you know, they can't ever find time for you, then it means that that relationship with you isn't something they prioritize because if they wanted to hang out with you and spend time with you, they would. If they wanted to, they would, right? But there can be many reasons behind this. If you're trying to date somebody or get into a relationship, buddy, re- relationship with somebody that works as hard as Elon Musk does and he's working 18 hours a day because that's what he finds meaning in in his life and that's what he has to do to live a life that he feels he should live, then you're going to have two very different ideas on the amount of time you need with one another to have a good relationship. And that's okay the same quote applies is if if they wanted to they would right maybe they do actually want to hang out with you and they are giving you the amount of time that they find meets their standard for a healthy relationship but that's not what matches yours that's fine and the quote still applies if they wanted to they would but you really have to think about it in the sense where it's not that this person doesn't like you or whatever it's just that you probably need more time and attention than they do and that's okay, but that just means that's not the person for you. At least maybe not at this point in time. Because if they're focused on other things and they don't want to spend as much time with you, then even though if they wanted to, they would, that it just means that you're not meant to be with one another, at least at this point in time. Um, so yeah, it, it's not a cookie cutter answer. There's there's a lot of things that go into it. It's just for me, I don't I, I don't like giving a one answer or trying to give a one answer that fits that fits all because especially with relationships relationships things are tricky and complicated and there's a lot of overlapping things that cause one another and that are correlated with one another and not actually causing one another whatever so it's it's tricky shit it's not always easy to get into um but yeah i think it's a good place to wrap this bad boy up Thank you guys for tuning in to episode number 14 and 48 of the Jason Score Show and the Conscious Cat. I'm sorry. What am I doing? Thank you guys very much for tuning in to episode number, I think, 48 of the Conscious Cast and I think 14 of the Jason Score Show. You could find Conscious Cal at Conscious Cal on TikTok and on YouTube and on Instagram, and you could find me at Jason Sclora, J A S O N S C A L O R A, on TikTok, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, soon to be LinkedIn. That's it for me for today. I don't know how to do outros. Peace.